fantastic. There are always ways to end a car. Yeah, this is wonderful. Really amazing. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here and to be here with all of you. experience of this wonderful culture, this life. What are some of your favorite elements of this particular community? We were talking about in the back. What makes this special to you? Honestly, it's sharing the joy. That's what, that's what I love about it. Um, this weekend, I have uh, received so much generosity and um, so much passion for um, the work that I've done and um, the ideas that we've shared and, and believe me, I feel the love, so I thank you. Um, I should say this is that I think um, we use fiction, you and I were chatting right there, um, fiction, fictional characters, in fictional stories, comic books, ancient narrative, superhero stories, to explain ourselves to ourselves. It's all a metaphor. It's all um, a way of exploring who we really are in our real lives. And we have done it forever as human beings, um, just like they used to do in the ancient epics. And the thing that moves me the most is that it's been my honor and my privilege to, to play Loki and to represent whatever he represents on that canvas and to, and to hear and witness how much he means to so many of you for so many different reasons. Um, and it's, uh, it creates an extraordinary, I feel, atmosphere of connection and togetherness is that actually we're telling these stories to understand who we are. Um, and so I'm grateful to you. Thanks. So before we go back to our before any of that, I want to go back to a headline from 20 years ago. Um, this headline read, or almost 20 years ago now, Marvel rolls dice, cast no names for Thor. <laughs> Like, I'm bring it up because you represent one of my favorite castings in the last 20 years. Like, you, I love, that's the direction it went. And in my opinion, Sarah Haley Finn is one of the names at Marvel, like the casting director who puts it all together. She's the, the one of them all in so many ways. What's unique about the Marvel casting process that allows them to build those relationships over decades that literally has to be a plug and play for so many different mediums, so many different universes, so many different relationships? What's the Marvel casting that in? First of all, I'm grateful to the writer for his endorsement and encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm uh, even more grateful to Sarah Hannah <laughs> And, and Randy Hiller, actually, who cast, both cast me in the first Thor movie. Um, and an extraordinary gift of their confidence in me and in Chris Hemsworth. Neither of us had done anything up to that point which could prove that we could deliver on our promise. I hope that we, could, we presented ourselves as people who were willing to work hard and, um, and were grateful for the opportunity. But it is amazing how they have populated this universe, you know, the constellations with um, disparate and versatile talent. Um, and the magic always, always with acting is, is what happens between you. Um, and I always feel if I've done any acting that's half decent, it's because of the actor I'm opposite. Um, it's, it's the... Uh, that's the joy of the unpredictability of the chemistry that you have. Um, and yes, my hat, hats off to Sarah um, for populating the MCU with these amazing actors who are able to create in the spaces between them these relationships which become more meaningful as time goes on. It's such a, a precious seed you have to plant and hope it turns into the trees that become the forest that becomes it. It's incredible. 
And I love that, you know, that Arnold did make that risky, I guess, at the time, gamble. Is there anything you remember from the casting process that now is interesting to ask about this evolved? Like a take, a choice, a, a decision you made about Lucky and then that's so different now? Uh, funny enough, in, in many respects, the center of the character, the soul of the character, feels the same. Um, and from that day to this, the thing I wanted to honor most was the complexity and depth and size of his soul. That, that Loki is an ancient character. Um, who is mischievous and playful and unpredictable and sometimes chaotic, sometimes vulnerable, sometimes destructive, often contradictory, but that the soul of this character is deep and I wanted his soulfulness to be evident from the get-go. Now, as the stories have changed and the movies have changed and my requirement in each story is different, um, in the Avengers, the point of view isn't from Loki's perspective, the point of view is from the Avengers' perspective. Um, but it's interesting, you sometimes have asked me this weekend, do you prefer playing the villain or the hero? And my response is, it's the same character. It's the story that changes who the hero is. Um, he's still this uh, deeply complex and contradictory character, as are we all. That actually brings me to our next question, because the god of mischief. Outside perspective, but what's your inner? Yeah, absolutely, he's that connection, he's that island. So, what do you think it is that you wanted to, in the beginning, before that, as much screen time as they had now, like, wanted to be that anchor, that island, that connection to the everyday person that's seen their humanity reflected in someone that, in his first iteration, he's felt very antagonistic? How did you want to anchor someone to be like, I'm rooting for him, I know I shouldn't like me? <laughs> I think it's the, the, the primary emotion that's at the center of him and I felt very fortunate in the, in the first Thor film that I was given by the late great Don Payne, the screenwriter, an ex extraordinary arc where very early on you got to see how lost and confused and vulnerable this character was so that his grievance was always rooted in grief. His rage was always rooted in vulnerability. Um, and so even when Loki is his most destructive and his most um, villainous, I suppose, I had had a second to present what was behind all of his anger, what was behind all of his um, misguided and, um, and destructive kind of element, um, which I think the audience could latch onto and go, okay, he's making some interesting choices. <laughs> <laughs> Decisions are made. Decisions, he's not thinking clearly. Um, and so I think it is in his nature. I think it is a, the whole point of the trickster in any mythology is that the trickster is a mercurial force, uh, a shapeshifter, a uh, transformer. Uh, disruptor, boundary crosser. As soon as you think you can pin him down, he's, he's shifted away into something else. And even like mean, Chris Hemsworth and I used to talk about uh, evolving their choreographic fighting style, as the Thor was like a block of granite and Loki was like the wind dancing around. But together, it could be very powerful. Um, so. But at least in the characterization, I had a moment to uh, reveal that, that the center of this detached, the mask of detachment and coolness and mischief was actually a very lost and broken soul um, looking for meaning, which I think is something I'm hope, I've hoped I've managed to continue um, all the way up to the end of Loki season two. I, I <laughs> So very recently, it was lovely to see you get to flex the Shakespeare muscles in 1602. I loved hearing that. Uh, one, was it even that improv? Because I know you've got it at the ready. And two, 
I love that Kenneth Branagh to me is like our Lawrence Olivier. He's our representative of the Bard. And I got to know, was it like on set with two Shakespeare guys while making something like Thor? Did you guys wax like poetic? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we, we um, I think it was part of Ken's pitch for the part uh, for the for the role of, of directing the film. Um, from, from memory. Thor was not an easy, um, as, as a movie, it's quite an interesting movie to pitch. And Marvel, I think, were thinking carefully about, you know, you've got gods and monsters and this shining citadel in the sky of Asgard and Rainbow Bridge and, you know, eight legged horses and, you know, and I think that Kenneth Branagh very clearly came in, spoke to Kevin Feige and said, I see what this is. This is like the best of Shakespeare's history plays. It's like Henry IV. Thor is Prince Hal, and he has to go on a journey um, of, from arrogance to humility in order to become Henry V. Um, and Odin is like King Lear, uh, or King Henry IV. Um, and Loki is like Iago, or, um, or Edmund in. Uh, in Lear, actually, the illegitimate son, the one who's cast aside, um, which is also true of Loki. Um, so I think Kevin Feige and, and the great producing team of Marvel thought, what a great take on this story. The, you know, the celestial space um, opera, I suppose, that, that, that Ken was going to root it in something very grounded, um, the dynastic drama, we're interested in the royal families, always. We're interested in what happens behind the closed doors in royal families, because if they disagree, it matters. And this royal family had a lot of, uh, you know, so it was sort of like that, really. And um, I remember looking at Anthony Hopkins and, and, and thinking, it was just like, you know, I said, Have you ever played King Lear? He said, No. Um, and now he has. Now he has. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not taking credit for the idea. He was always in the car. Certainly so <laughs> yeah. Now, you are so versatile in your work, but there's a flu line that I personally love on one of the channels. There's this poetry in your work, like John Roach, when you worked with him, and I love the poetry that I felt. It literally feels like a poem come to life in the lovers. And then when Del Toro scripts a peak, it felt like the, the sensory of the ink was part of it. To me, Del Toro felt like a poem, and to me, Del Toro felt like the ink was part of the frame that we saw through the end of the story. And then with Woody Allen, the night Paris felt like a love song, and it felt like a love poem, it felt like this poetry. And I wonder, is there a certain sensibility you look for in a script, or do you think your mechanism is just a tune for that kind of poetry? It's such an interesting way to put it. You're probably right. I mean, I love poetry, um, and my appreciation for it has grown as I've got older. Um, the abstract, which then, the abstract form of the arrangement of words, which then the individual can subjectively interpret according to his or her own experience of being alive. I think they are very poetic directors. Um, uh, and I love making all those films, Jim, certainly. Yeah. The thing that was most poetic about that was he'd taken something that's quite um, popular in cinema, the, the idea of vampires and literature, I suppose, and used it to explore the idea of mortality and, and death. By which I mean, if you take two vampires, who, by their very nature, don't die. Um, you are considering, because of course we do, and any meditation on death also brings about a, a reflection on life and how we make life mean something and how we make our short time on this planet worth it. And really that's what that film is about. And, and that, that great line that um, Tilda Swinton has, which is life is about surviving things, appreciating nature, nurturing kindness and friendships, and dancing. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a beautiful feeling. Yeah. Um, and she's trying to help Adam so she's trying to help him out of his depression. Um, and uh, it's so 
a beautiful um, conception of the film. And then Giello, Giello is really making a similar, well, similar in some senses, but it was his um, tribute or his, um, it finally his, his version of the Gothic romance, which is his favorite form of literature. Um, where you're, the story is actually investigating some really primary engines in our lives and the battle between love and fear and all of our choices essentially boil down between those two forces. You either make a choice out of love or you make a choice out of fear. And Mia Dashikovsky's character, Edith Cushing, is is light and love, and she is kind of banishing the shadow of fear in everything that she sees, and, and in, in my character, Thomas Sharp. Um, and I think Lucille Sharp, played by Jessica Chastain, is a kind of emblem of fear and how fear can um, uh, corrode the soul in some way. Um, but um, yeah, I love making that film. It, it does have a very um, unique strain of sincerity, which is very um, unique to Kiyama, yeah. 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 which I appreciate. Yeah, I like it. It feels like the smell of the book. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you would love that. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like always when I play that film. Like this is like a yeah. nice book. Yeah, yeah. you would love that. Uh, now, you officially got my favorite art the MCU, and speaking of that poetry, there's something so going on to me about the God of Stories concept recontextualized through the cursed and glorious purpose ideal that I love was planted so many years ago and just like casting against to germinate and become this tree. And I've wondered ever since, has that recontextualization of the concept of the God of Stories through that line changed how you thought about that line when you delivered it as a different Loki only years ago? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it was it, it was a great line. Even then, I loved saying it. Um, I had to say it all the way up. It's so uh, it's so grand um, and theatrical. Um, and in that moment, he's he's um, I think he's coloring. He's improvising. Yeah. Um, he can back it up. Um, well, at least he tries. <laughs> Tom shows up, it's all the thing. Oh, and the Avengers, those pesky, that pesky team. <laughs> but you show up. Um, but uh, yes, the most exciting thing, I remember when I was, uh, I cast my mind back to a couple of years ago now, almost exactly, and I was in Los Angeles with a great team who made Loki, Kevin Wright, our producer, Castro Farahani, our production designer, um, Eric Martin, the head writer, and some other brilliant producers and writers who are part of the writers group. And we had a board, and at the top of, that, at the, top of the board, um, we had a big sign, just a glorious purpose question mark. Because I kept insisting, I think, episode one of season one. Loki discovers that the glorious purpose that he felt was a part of his mission and a part of the center of his capacity to derive meaning from his life was fraudulent, a lost cause with no foundation. It leads to nothing. It leads to the suffering of his friends and his own death. And so, and Mobius gives him the second chance and it's this journey through the TVA and trying to understand himself meeting Sylvie and going on a journey with her, meeting the other Loki variants, and then finally getting to the Citadel at the end of time and thinking, how do I reinvigorate, redefine, rediscover this sense of purpose? How could I derive meaning from my life? And it's such a great engine for a character uh, such a just driving forward um, and making sure he doesn't waste it again. But then it also became a great question for every character. What's glorious purpose for Mobius? What's glorious purpose for Sylvie? How does she find purpose after she's done what she came to do and uh, execute eager remains? 
What's Chloe's purpose for B15, who finds out that she had a life on the timeline? What's Chloe's purpose for the TVA? Suddenly all these people at the TVA they think they've been working for this institution that claims to govern the order of time, and actually they find out that there is more moral ambiguity in their actions. And can this broken institution be repurposed for something better? Which is a debate we have in the world all the time. Can broken institutions be reorganized um, without being swept away? So Glory's purpose became this true north for the compass of the show. Um, and of course, for Loki and, and his desperation to to make it mean something um, in the face of so much confusion and so much loss and um, and the stakes are really high. Yeah. You know, these uh, the the multiverse, you know, people are trying to destroy people's lives. So and it led to these amazing conversations about the whole nature of purpose, which I think is very resonant in all of our lives. And um, I kind of believe that we all, that's what we're all searching for. We want a purpose in our lives. And it led to some great discussions. Kevin Ryan and I used to have, we had a whiteboard and we wrote the, um, the great Socrates quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. Perfect parallel to get out to And you know, we started reading Victor Franco and Man's Search for Meaning and his idea of that freedom and responsibility actually go hand in hand. You can't have freedom without responsibility. Um, and you can't have responsibility without freedom. Um, and I started quoting T.S. Eliot and everything else. Um, but uh, it was a really, it felt like a, a fantastic and um, fruitful place to start, especially as in season one we've been talking about free will and predeterminism and all these kind of quite philosophical ideas, which I felt like a real, I couldn't believe they let us get away with this. <laughs> when we were talking back there, I think art is more of a feeling than a, than a thing you think through. And I think Gloria's Purpose is something we all feel more than we think about feeling. So I love the idea of Gloria's Purpose became a narrative we can attach ourselves to to feel the art more directly. And that's why I think that arc is so profound over the years, because every time we feel in a different medium, it's a different feeling that we can't pin down uh, and that brings me to another question. Yeah, I mean, just to a point, I think when we, when we in our lives feel lost, we feel like, what's my purpose? And I think Loki has represented that. And we look for an art, which comes back to the world for us. Oh, that's all. <laughs> I see what you did that. <laughs> I love when that character's name is like, this is going to be a lot. I'm going to go on this journey for a while. Uh, now, I've known Justin Aaron in real life for years. Uh, I love those guys dearly. They're delightful. They mentioned a few things when I told them I was going to be sitting down with you. Uh, a current passion for tennis, Mr. Day from the Endless, and Heat. And I want to know, one, uh, why Heat right now? And two, what are you doing in art that you want to share with others that would be something that you recommend for someone looking for glorious purpose? Like, is there any art that's going to be driving you lately? Sometimes talk about 
matches that I remember was going for five hours and it, you know, it goes to the fifth set and you see these close-ups of these amazing tennis players' faces and it looks like they've been through something. <laughs> um, it's incredibly profound, they still got the fire. And I would sometimes go, that's what location looked like. And just at the end, we like, we haven't seen, we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs>
these traumas that has happened in my life and he tries to make himself a better person. I think it's very inspirational for anyone who can hear, especially me. He changed my life. Thank you. I love you. Hey, let's go. Uh, my name's Matt. I'm from my football in Florida. Just keep that big thing. 
Uh, we've also got one from Katie O.B., which I wonder if that's an intentional name, or if your name is actually O.B., fit for Loki. Uh, from Claremont Florida, who asks, if you went to a convention and cosplay as anyone but Loki, who would it be? Thor! <laughs> yeah, I, I, my first thought was, um, was Spider-Man. Uh, 
technically what you call it, um, but some operating piece of machinery. <laughs> a bit of uh, temporal loom engineering. But, but that was all there, it was all built. And uh, so all those scenes with Owen and Sophia and Kiki and Wimmy and Eugene, we, we were up there all the time and it felt it felt like there was something out there. You know, it felt like there was a temporal loom out there that was about to blow. It's pretty exciting. It's so helpful. Yeah. It snakes feel more yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah. And then actually there were these, because obviously, sorry to break the illusion, but there was not in fact a temporal loom. <laughs> It is pretty, 
It's quite strange, is it? Just to the first day when it's died, brushing my teeth at the end of the day, I go, oh, there it is. <laughs> Less like a bird's nest and more like something smooth and Loki like. Um, you know, getting the, getting the hair chair, I think it gets blow dried. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be over the years yeah, as well. So <laughs> Sometimes I think it's sort of because it's he's in his jerky scenarios, or his, his, his body is being jerked around. So it's just sort of getting out of the space, and then it's become his signature. And 
and we used to just say to each other, to remind each other, the best thing about a story, it's really simple, is to remind yourself that this has never happened before. And actually, it, it invigorates everyone on the set with a sense of mistakes. Like, it's never happened before, and it matters what happens next. And it means that suddenly the stakes get become very high, and everyone gets very serious. And it means that any comedy actually comes out of the intensity of it. It's like a, it's no one's grasping at that sort of laughter that feels shallow. It's often the laughter is from like intense disagreement or or yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and to pay tribute to them, uh, at the very end of episode six of season two. Um, Justin Aaron turned to me and we were doing Loki walking up the steps and with the tough lines in his hands and uh, moving towards sitting in the chair and what that would mean. And very complex day in terms of filming. Um, the camera was on a techno crane and it was kind of moving around the, the stairs and Justin Aaron turned to me and said, I think we're going to be in here, which is the size of the shot, we're going to be really close to your face, in about 30 minutes. How can we help you with where you need to be there, then? And I said, I, I don't know, it just makes me think of like the 15 years of played this character and Aaron said, why don't you go away? Because it's, the energy of the, the set was very practical. So just go and take a minute, and why don't you watch some of the scenes from the last 15 years? And, which was a brilliant note. It was so clever, because it made me think of, for me personally, me and Tom, it made me reflect on the friendships that I had made in this journey. The people I've met, the laughter we shared, the lessons I've learned personally. And by the time I came back in to shoot the scene, I was carrying all of those memories with me. And it felt very fresh and very resonant, and it all came from Justin and Aaron's suggestion to do that. And so that last shot is me thinking of all the people that I've shared this journey with, um, which is who he's talking about. In the end, he says, for you, for all of us.
to ask him. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, how am I going <laughs> Or, can you get a lot of time? 